Okay, so I'm going to talk to you guys about equine tracheal endoscopy, and this summer I got the opportunity to perform endoscopy on a horse um, at the vet school here uh, under Dr. Cotillo. We were doing a research project. So this is sometimes done um, as a veterinarian when they're trying to diagnose horses or in research. So what is it? Um, endoscopy is the use of a video endoscope uh, to examine the airways um, in this case. And um, it's really cool because as you, um, you know, use the endoscope, you can see exactly what's inside the horse on a monitor. Um, and so reasons that uh, this might be performed is if horses are coughing, have nasal discharge, uh, labored breathing, abnormal noises, or poor performance. And these all indicate that there's something going on, a respiratory disease. Um, and like I said, vet veterinarians might do this to diagnose a horse or in our case, we were doing a research project. So this is a picture um, of a horse, and you can see that two people are usually on each side holding the horse, um, and they're guiding the endoscope in. Um, and then another person is um, kind of controlling it right here, and there's actually little dials, and you, because it is a fiber optic tube, you can um, use these dials um, on this control system, and inside, it's actually twisting and turning, and if you want to go into a certain uh, bronchial, you can do that, so it's really neat. Um, this is the end of the endoscope. There is a camera right here, um, a light, so you can see um, this little part right here um, is used to flush water through, so if uh, the camera, you know, there gets stuff on it, you can't really see, then you can just flush it with water. And then this is another port for an instrument, and I'll talk more about what that's used for. Good. I was going to ask about sedation. Yeah, so um, sedation is optional for this. Um, in our case, we did use sedation. We used alizine and butorphanol because we were more focused on the lower respiratory. But if a horse was showing symptoms and a veterinarian wanted to look at the larynx or um, the movement more in the upper respiratory, they would not use sedation <coughs> because that just kind of makes that movement lazy and it's not a good representation of what's going on. So it is optional. In our case, we did use it. Uh, and the butorphanol was um, good just to, to kind of calm that cough reflex because when you are in there, the horses want to cough. That uh, makes the job a little bit harder. Um, so you start by passing it up the nostril with the use of a local anesthetic gel and spray. So we'd use lidocaine gel um, on the endoscope. And then also we had um, a sprayer go through that instrument port that I show you. And we'd squirt lidocaine locally. Um, just so it would kind of, you know, numb that area. And uh, we would direct into the ventral nasal meatus. So um, the person that's directing the endoscope would use their thumb to hold it at the bottom of the nostril and kind of advance it slowly. Um, and then you would go into the pharynx or throat region, and then I'll show you a diagram of the larynx, and then you'd pass into the trachea. Before you go on. Yeah. This meatus, my pointer isn't very good, but that's a general term meaning a passageway. Like your ear canal can be called the external auditory meatus. So if you ever see meatus, that means a passageway. I love these terms. So this is a picture of the larynx, and this is a normal, healthy horse. Um, you see the arytenoid, I don't know if I'm saying it right, cartilage um, on each side. And when they breathe, they kind of constrict um, and open. And then you can see the epiglottis down here at the bottom. And when a horse swallows, the epiglottis um, kind of flips up and covers that airway, the trachea. Uh, the esophagus is actually up here. So when they swallow, um, the epiglottis covers this up, and the food just goes right up into the esophagus. Uh, you can see the vocal cords on each side and then the opening to the trachea. You did a great job with that slide. Wow. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so this is an example of something that does not look normal. Um, this is laryngeal hemiplasia or right-sided laryngeal paralysis. When you're looking at this, it's actually the opposite. So this is the right-sided. Um, and you can see how this is normal and this is just kind of sagging right here. This is a mechanical uh, problem. And um, this is seen most commonly when horses are doing intense exercise. So you can actually um, do an endoscope while a horse is on a treadmill. And we actually have one here at the Purdue Vet Hospital. And um, it's really neat. And so 
to correct this, you can actually do a tie back surgery, and so they'll go in from outside of the neck and they'll suture it up so that way it's open um, and so it won't limit airflow. Every time I see that a horse on that treadmill, I fear that it's going to run off the end. You know, <laughs> something's going to happen. But. This is another example. This is dorsal displacement um, of the soft palate, and it also restricts the airflow. You can see where the epiglottis should be. It's actually underneath the soft palate. So when a horse is doing intense exercise, um, also race horses, they can run on the track and they can do an endoscope um, kind of just while they're running, and then the vet can look at it on a monitor when it's not connected at all. So that's really neat. So clinical signs in the trachea. Um, so there might be discharge from the lungs, um, inflammation, and that can be caused from allergens, foreign bodies, poor hair quality, um, inhaled irritants. There are bacterial infections, viral infections, and then, um, for instance, like inflammatory airway disease. Those are all things that can happen. Um, so you might see mucus from this recurrent airway obstruction or what you might know as heaves, and then pus from pneumonia. So this is what I got from uh, my professor, and this is how he ranks the trachea. Um, so this would be considered normal, healthy, and then you can see it increasingly gets worse, and there's a lot of discharge right here. So um, an example um, of recurrent airway obstruction, or RIO, like I said, is uh, also known as he's and this is more in the lower airway, so you'd be going down into the trachea, um, and uh, the clinical signs are coughing, labored breathing, flared nostrils, um, discharge or reduced performance, and this is something that if a horse was standing still, they'd be just breathing really hard just to stay in there, and that's not normal. Um, so you really see the symptoms when they're doing heavy exercise or they're in a dusty environment, and um, the signs can be reduced by just proper management, trying to reduce that dust, whether it's bedding or if it's in their um, feed quality, if you wanted to switch from like hay to something different to try to reduce that. And that's just a diagram of what happens. So it's definitely harder for them to breathe. These are both normal pictures. This one does look red, but that's just the coloring. Um, so this right here is where the trachea splits into two bronchi, and then you can kind of see how it just keeps splitting into bronchioles and then further splits. So it was really cool because we advanced further and further until we actually wedged. So we went through a lot of different pathways, and he knew, Dr. Cotill knew exactly where he was going, and I was like, it's so confusing. Supposedly, I think there's 20 branches before you get to the LV line. Yeah, it's crazy. It's really cool, though. Yeah. So one thing that we did was a BAL or bronchoalveolar lavage and so we were looking at the lower airways <coughs> and basically we would wedge the um, endoscope and we would flush sterile saline in and then we'd use a vacuum or some people also do like a catheter method and get that um, sample back out so you can see what kind of cells, what kind of bacteria and viruses are down in the airway. Um, this can be used to diagnose or in our case to do research and so you can do um, clinical tests with that sample and then a cytology brush is we'll actually use a brush through the endoscope and it stays in the endoscope until you get to the spot where you want. You advance the brush out, you just rub it against their airway, bring it back in so it stays um, representative of that spot, and then you pull it out and you have a little sample of the cells that are in the airway. <coughs> so I will try to show you a video. Keep track of everything. Masana goes beyond project management to help you fill in the blanks. little bit blurry but you can kind of get an idea. So there's the larynx opening. Is there any sound or is it just visual basically? I don't think there's oh. any sound. Okay, yeah. okay, yeah. So we're going down. So you can see all the, um, it looks like that's, they're spraying probably like a lidocaine or a local anesthetic right there. And um, if you wanted to do like a lavage of the trachea, you would just squirt out uh, sterile saline and then use like a catheter to pull it back out and then you would have a sample. 
this is basically all it is. But mm -hmm. I just wanted you guys yeah. to see what it looked like and. No, that's good. Yeah. Do you guys have any questions? Ready for questions? I'll let you point. Okay. Um. So does this block them from swallowing? No, they can still swallow. So um, I showed you how. Let me go back to this picture real quick. Um, so they actually, when they're under sedation, especially, um, they can still swallow. And when they're under sedation, this happens normally. So, um, like everything is normal, they can still swallow. And then when we pull back out, where you like wait to make sure they'll swallow and their epiglottis will go back into normal positioning. Um, because when they're, first, when they're sedated for whatever reason, they get this displacement of the soft palate. So it looks really funny when you pull back out, we just sit there for a minute and they just naturally swallow and then it just like pops back out. And so yeah, everything's fine. But they're obviously not eating when we do this, so it's not a problem. So is this normally just a thoroughbred issue or is it just any horse that does like high intensity workouts so like quarter horses and range or <laughs> barrel racing? Um, it can be any horse, doesn't even matter if they are doing intense exercise, but um, it's definitely more prevalent in horses. I guess you can see it when they do intense exercise. So our focus um, was on the research horses that Purdue owns and then we also went to the racetrack in Shelbyville did sampling of horses at the track right after they raced too. Mm -hmm. So it's just easier to see when after they do intense exercise, but it can be in any horse. Yeah. yeah. This is more of an anatomical question, but I thought there there were two separate pipes. I mean, there, there was only breathing through the nose and it just a straight pipe going back down to the lungs and then there was one 